for me, it's the difference between self-censorship and emotional intelligence. Um, self-censoring would, would be if you're actually not prepared to go that far. And emotional intelligence is, I'm going to go that far, I'm going to say it, but I'll have to find a different way to say it. Buckingham Palace, we're in the offices of Jakarta Media in Johannesburg, you're about to hear from a veritable prince in the media aristocracy disclosing some of his deep dark secrets. Prince Jonathan Shapiro, <laughs> better known as Zapiro, has agreed to talk to me about his controversial past and in which direction he sees the political wind blowing in the future, and to talk about his latest collection of his best political cartoons for the last 12 months. Which side is up? <laughs> which side is up? Well, Ace Magashule or who? Brilliant sort of insight. For four decades, for those of you who don't know, particularly the younger generation, Zapiro has been a courageous inspiration and trailblazer for otherwise timid activists like me, for his bold use of his mighty pen in speaking truth to power. For me personally, it started with his artwork for the Inconscription Campaign and the UDF in the 80s, and his consistent championing of the right to freedom of expression then in the 90s as paving the way for democracy, uh, the Mandela years when the, you know, the romance of the, kind of the new infatuation with democracy and he kept going because then we saw the Thabo Mbeki's government with respect to the arms deal and then of course the HIV AIDS. And he kept sharpening his mighty sword to expose the betrayal of the values that had brought the ANC to power. And over the last decade of course it's been all about state capture and Jacob Zuma and his work has managed to earn him a defamation slap suit from former President Jacob Zuma who claimed for damage done to his reputation by his appearance political cartoons. So, if anyone deserved to be knighted for his services to the democratization of society, it would be Sir Jonathan Shapiro. <laughs> but Jonathan, if you hypothetically found yourself on the Queen's honours list to be knighted for services to the media, what would you do? You're not a great fan of inherited privilege and royalty, are you? And I, I really am not. I mean, I think that monarchies and royalty and royal families and all of that stuff, it, it, it's an absurd idea in the 21st century. Uh, it was an absurd idea long ago, but even more so now. It was always that they get their power from divine somebody, right. the divine right. It's the divine mm -hmm. right to, to have dominion over other people in terms of the, the resources, the land the, um, and, and rights. Yeah. Uh, so that's how the Swazi king can get like 60 cars and Rolls Royces and Bentleys and whatever when the people of Swaziland are suffering and are poverty stricken. And that's the kind of thing that happens everywhere. But you know, it's a bit ironic because I've got two books for you to sign. Uh, one is for me and the other one is for one of your greatest fans, who is a royal, the Queen of the Yamampondo, Queen Lombokiso Sikau. And as you know, it's become a custom of mine to, at your annual events to get you to sign and autograph a book. Okay, she is somebody who's exceptional. She has taken issue with the assumption that you just described, that the traditional leadership bestows on you the right. She's always seen herself as being a servant of customary law and of the people's democratic participation mm. in an inclusive way. And I found myself in my own book of trying to sort of say, is there a place for royalty in its original conception mm. in the pre-colonial sense, which was inclusive, which was participatory? You know, it's, it's difficult because you're putting, it, you're, you're putting some very interesting points there. Well, I, what, what, let me qualify what I said right at the beginning. When I say I don't like royalty, I don't like those institutions, I certainly don't mean to say that there's, no, there's never been any good royal royals or people who by accident of birth have found themselves in a position where they are 
uh, able to use their power uh, and, and actually become people who can do good. And there are people like that. And it's fantastic. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And when about they start doing their job, unfortunately, yeah. they get challenged. And, and of course. That's exactly what's happened to you. And I would <laughs> even say in my own experience, I've had a couple of experiences of royalty that that were, that did make me think, well, I, I, I just, I must know that there are some people who, who operate slightly differently. In 2005, I was given a fantastic honor by the Netherlands, mm. the, prince, the principal Prince Klaus Award. Uh, now, Prince Klaus was the, he had married into the, the royal family, so he was the prince. Uh, there was the, the queen of the Netherlands who I, I well, now I now met the queen. Um, I actually sat next to the queen uh, when I was given this award. And he, they, he set up this fund where they, they have one principal award, which they give every year, and 10 secondary awards. Mm. And I got the principal one, um, and it's for culture that's under threat anywhere in the world, mm. either through censorship or the, the pressures of modern society on culture so that, that things become sort of almost defunct and uh, mm. people are trying to keep that culture alive. Mm. So um, I was very impressed by the Queen and the, and the other royals, and they... Mm. And they're quite down to earth and they have good concerns at heart mm -hmm. and they give this award every year. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. I also met the Norwegian royal family when I was taken to the Oslo Peace Center mm -hmm. and uh, with South African artists and our ex exhibition was about the fact that we have four Nobel Peace Prize winners. We're the only country still to have four. And, and another thing, I've, I've had a recent award I mean, last week, um, the, I have to say it properly, Chevalier des Arts et Lettres. That's the best I can do. My French isn't good. But it's a Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters from the French government, from the President of France, by the Minister of Culture and the Ambassador of France. You know, those awards of knighthoods, whether they're English or French, are also from that feudal structure. So if there's a way of using those old structures to do something which is r really nice and really, I think, amazing for the recipients of those awards, uh, well, that, that, that's great. I mean, they, they're acknowledging or recognizing artists and people involved in culture around the world. Uh, they've been doing this in France since 1957 mm. and there are people like Susan Sontag who've mm. been given this award and here in South Africa, Johnny Clegg, Zanelli mm. Maholi, uh, Gregory Matkoma, um, uh, William Kentridge, so I'm an amazing company. Mm. And yeah, so I, I, th I think it's a structure that can still be used. And it is. And I mean, it's, it's somewhat interesting because you talk of its feudal structure and I know that you've also been, in some ways, the joker in the pack. The joker, or the or the court jester, is actually allowed to pillory you know, the king, but within a certain boundary. How do you know where that boundary lies? I mean, do you have a boundary? I meet your friend Andy Mason, um, and in his book, What's So Funny, he talks about that episode where there was a concern that your Lady Justice cartoons particularly might have gone beyond mm. that. He talks about, I think it's more particularly the cross-cultural context, where certain kind of metaphors yeah. and idioms that we would understand from yeah. westernized, western culture, from the Greeks and you know Plato and Aristotle, yes. don't, often might be totally misunderstood. How have you handled that cross-cultural mm. thing? Um, look, I, I, I acknowledge that there are some of those things, but I, my, my primary idea around that is that cartoonists get flack for not understanding those cultural strictures or, 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 or differences, cultural specificities. They get that all over the world. And it's one of those um, things that people often use to try and delegitimize yes. a cartoonist or a satirist. They mm -hmm. say, well, you actually don't understand. They, they, they make a, a sort of exceptionalism. Exactly. I mean, there was, a, there was something that happened a, a, a while ago, which I was quite shocked about. A, a cartoonist colleague of, of, of mine, who his name's Heng, mm -hmm. he's from Singapore. And he does very, very good cartoons, very proficient, easily understood. Some of them appear in international publications. 
we were suddenly made aware that, uh, wait a minute, there are no really critical cartoons about Singapore. Yeah. They are about every, everywhere else, even about China and about India, some things that are fairly touchy, but not about his own circumstances. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that he has to contend with is that in in the local culture, and, and there's a sort of, that kind of benign dictatorship sort of thing that, whatever that is in, in Singapore as well, you've got, you've got the authoritarian aspect and you've got local cultural specificities. Mm -hmm. He can't depict people as animals. Uh, yes. uh, he, he can, all he can do is, is do, you know, depict people as, as people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that makes it very difficult to do the kind of cartoons mm -hmm. that, that, that he'd like to do. Mm -hmm. A pig would have a certain meaning and a, a mouse and a dog and a this and a that. I mean, we do cartoons about all sorts of things. That said, my worst mm -hmm. encounter with political correctness and with my sort of biggest misstep mm -hmm. was a, around an animal depiction. and. I was trying to do something nuanced. Mm -hmm. I, I was not, unable to do that in the in the sort of new social media era where a cartoon went down perfectly fine until a particular mm -hmm. group focused and, and it was almost sort of tried to cheerlead mm -hmm. everyone to see it as a as a as a racist cartoon. Mm -hmm. It was the yeah, organ yeah. grinders monkey yes, cartoon. Uh, where your the large target was Jacob Zuma, mm -hmm. um, done fully human, and the metaphor was carefully mm -hmm. constructed in a way that's been done scores of times before mm -hmm. in cartoons mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. And another state organ, another organ grinder's monkey, it was Sean Abrams, drawn carefully as part of the cartoon, in in sort of monkey looking with the little. A uniform and things that no generalized form of racism at all. I mean, because Jacob Zuma, the main target of the cartoon, is a big human person, mm. and Sean Abrams was a little monkey. Now, that nearly destroyed me mm. far more than mm. than what Justice. happened with the, about the Lady Justice mm. cartoon. I am, I will, I stand one hundred percent behind the Lady Justice cartoon. I will not apologize for that ever. I know there are interesting debates around it with feminists and I spoke at the time about mm. trying to understand how women might see the cartoon. Mm. That worried me and I was very concerned about it. I tried very carefully to make sure that Lady Justice, as I depicted her, you, you would feel empathy mm. for the victim of what looks like a gang rape uh, about to happen. I think a, a person who has empathy wouldn't feel um, I, that they would identify with these these people who were the antagonists, mm. the males. It was also a metaphor, because Lady Justice is a symbol, an emblem, a metaphor. Mm. So even though the the rest were caricatures of real people, mm. it becomes a metaphor if the central mm. uh, person is somebody who's not real but a symbol. I have debated with a couple of feminists who who say that um, again it's. Some of it is more recent. A male cannot use the rape metaphor at all. Mm. Uh, so there's, there, there are issues about fem feminism. There's issues about w whether a male can, you know, am I appropriating something to use mm. uh, and, and, and triggering and to use the metaphor at all and to do it repeatedly. Uh, then there's the, the, the stuff that Andy Mason was talking about, the, the almost ogre depiction of Jacob Zuma. Now, that is a standard kind of cartooning thing where you use somebody, their, their features, you exactly. distort them and exaggerate them to bring out aspects of their personality. It's not a racial uh, distortion in any way. He, he doesn't, there's no generic sort of African look that I'm, I'm giving him. It's just I'm showing him, I, I pull his eyes wide apart which, and, and, and his pupils sometimes looking in different directions. He does look a bit monstrous. Um, and then I put the shower on his head. There's no cultural anything about that. Mm. So... I see Donald Trump's got it too. Yeah, <laughs> Donald Trump's got it because of the golden shower, which is a whole different story. But...
wrong if I didn't add that part of what Andy was talking about, even if he didn't believe it all himself, and that because there were other people who did try and take it down this route, the sexualized nature of that image, just because it deals with rape, is that tapping into some of the prejudices that white people have had about about Africa? Is because you see some very some very awful depictions, uh, very generalized ones from from a hundred years before, or even fifty years before. Is that something that that I was was doing? I certainly wasn't. In my opinion, mm. I was just talking about Jacob Zuma himself. Mm. Uh, am, am I criticizing him as a traditionalist uh, because of um, uh, satirizing him for the, the many uh, babies out of wedlock? Uh, no, I was criticizing him there because, as uh, head of state, he was delivering speeches on HIV and AIDS. Becky had been an AIDS denialist. Zuma changed and became. He made some pretty good speeches on HIV and AIDS, but he broke every rule that he set for everyone else. So it's about hypocrisy. hypocrisy. Mm. So anyway, that's the, and there probably are a number of other angles I haven't even touched on, mm. but it is it's complex. And I know I'm, I was wading into deep water, mm. but I'm I'm still prepared to. There's a lot more I could say about Lady Justice. And I want to talk now about Jacob Zuma's retaliation against you. I mean, you had got threats a number of times from court action against you for you know kind of defamation and libel and all the rest. Yeah. The first one was Baleka and Bete <laughs> yeah, in 1997. Really? Yeah. He finally followed through and filed papers in court. Yeah. And tell us about that slap scene. Yeah. Well, you, you keep referring to it as the as singular. There's two. And there are two major suits. Mm. The first one, and uh, I think you've, um, you'll be surprised when you hear the numbers because it's a hell of a lot more than what you, you may have thought. In 2006, uh, Jacob Zuma sued not just me, he sued a whole number of people and entities in media for 63 million rand. What? <laughs> yeah, there were about eight different groups, but my part in it was 15 million, not five, five for each of three cartoons. Mm. That was the equivalent of two million US dollars. Mm. Nobody else in the history of the world before or since has ever been sued for, for, for cartoons for more than one million US dollars. That was double, and still is, double any, the, the lawsuit anyone else has, has tried for, mm. right? He then sued me for seven million rand in 2008 for the Lady Justice cartoon. And the, so that's a total of 22 million. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, um, I thought I had sort of beaten you because I had <laughs> seven and a half million from this Aussie miner who's seeing me. Look, there are, your figures may be more important because <laughs> if they actually, I hope it's not going to be successful, but if they win any damages, that is problematic. I hope not. But um, in my case, I was fully confident that the courts would yeah, uphold yeah. our uh, fight against, you know, our yeah. fight back against the lawsuits. And they did. Eventually, Zuma had to drop both. Both. Yeah, he dropped them both. But oh, do you not have some regret that they didn't? Well, I have yeah. a regret yeah, because yeah. I would have liked a, a ruling yeah. because that would have then cleared sort of any yeah. ambiguities about how, you know, what public interest yeah. is, what truth is, and how exactly social workers go about their job. Exactly, because the, 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 there had been an amazing ruling, a uh, great ruling, as, as authored by Albie Sachs mm. on the uh, Justin Nurse's T-shirt battle, oh, yeah. with, which again has a lot to do with what you're fighting because it's, it's, it's corporate bullying and mm. corporate lawsuits. It was when SA Breweries sued mm. Justin Nurse for the black labor, white guilt, mm. uh, the, 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 the Amstel um, parody, mm. uh, black labor, white guilt. Do you remember that, yes, uh, that shirt? Do, yeah. And um, Albie Sachs uh, authored a great judgment there, which was about the laughter being the great solvent of society mm -hmm. and about um, how people must have it, not just laughter, must be able to take satire and criticism and metaphorical criticism, all of that kind of stuff, which it was, a, it was great. Problem for Justin Nurse was that unlike when Jacob Zuma sued me in both those big cases, mm -hmm. I had the backing of the newspaper groups mm -hmm. who would pay my lawyer's costs mm -hmm. and also damages if there were any. Justin, it was a sort of a pyrrhic victory for him because mm. they ruined him.
It went all the way up to the Constitutional Court and they had a whole lot of annuals in which they had uh, printed images of this shirt and they were not even able to sell their books. So they had like 9,000 books and financially it had ruined them. Mm. But in my case, um, the, I even had offers from mm. other groups, let alone the newspapers, to, to, to back mm. me up. And I was, I was lucky that we had that. And therefore I could give him the finger throughout the mm. process until he, he eventually had to back down. Now, I'm, as you say, I'm very sorry that the second lawsuit, the one for 7 million, which mm. then became 5 million, the Lady Justice one, he sued me for four years and by, and really that was one day away from going to court. Mm. I had great lawyers, I had uh, Dario Miller and his team at Weber Wenzel, they would briefed Vim Trengrove. I'd been put through my paces already, uh, like they said I talked too much, uh, and surprise, surprise. <laughs> they said I was just answer the questions. But I was re we, were, we had compiled a fantastic list and I'd helped in that because I've been watching so much mm. of the way that Zuma and his allies mm. had bullied and threatened the judiciary mm. to actually get those, court, uh, those, those corruption charges dropped so he could become mm. president of the country. He was already ANC mm. president. And that was the nub of it. His lawyers knew that it mustn't get to court because be if we, it would actually have been... Ramifications on those other cases. Yeah. Yes. So I'm yeah. sorry that it didn't get... I am sorry that eventually yeah. it didn't get... Did you have, uh, maybe we need to have another conversation if our case does get to court, because there's six of us. It's mm. not just me. Mine's the largest, seven and a half million. The others are one million each. Yeah. Three lawyers and two activists. <laughs> I obviously am rather looking forward to it because yeah. over the 14 years that I've been involved, I've been painstakingly careful to ensure I've got a paper trail yeah. and that what I'm doing is entirely within my lane as a social yeah. worker of challenging social injustice yeah. and I look forward to the opportunity yeah. to get into court yeah. and we've been told that the, the only way you can basically fend this off, you've got to win. Yeah. You know, you can get legislation yeah. passed that actually outlaw slap yeah. suits as they've done in the United yeah. States. But the best way yeah. is actually going to court and winning because that then has a deterrent effect on any other would-be slappers. Yeah. Did it intimidate you? I mean, it seemed like you had one cartoon where you said, meet my publicist, Jacob Zuber. Yeah. And he did you a great favor. I, yeah. And your book sales rocketed. I, some of that was slightly flippant. I mean, it's not, uh, the, the, there were people who were using that against me, the idea that I do these things for publicity or whatever. That's not the, the case at all. The, the, when you get uh, sort of threatened in, in many ways, or when you get vilified, I, I was called both a racist and a rapist mm -hmm. for, for, that, for that cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're not, you're not going to do that kind of stuff in a hurry just for fun or for you know, the publicity or book sales or whatever. It was, it was a joke, that thing about the, the publicists. But I did not back down and didn't want to back down. The first time he sued me, the very next cartoon I did, uh, I had him coming into the room uh, and me sitting at my, at my desk and he says, I'm suing for damage to your, your reputation. And I say to him in the cartoon, <laughs> Would that be your reputation <laughs> as a disgraced chauvinistic demagogue who can't control his sexual urges and he thinks a shower prevents AIDS? It's partly right back at him and in his face. But partly what it's doing is saying, hang on, you're suing for your reputation. That's a serious question. That is your reputation. So I am actually saying what right. is in the legitimate, go. it's in the public domain, that that's what people think about you. Mm for good reason, because of your actions exactly. and your words. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, that wasn't just a joke, that was deliberately thought through mm -hmm. as, a, as a way of getting back at him. You mm -hmm. say, you see me for this? Ah, you mean this? Yeah. And the second thing was, I put the three cartoons that he was suing me for mm -hmm. back in print. They were, he was holding miniature versions of the same three cartoons, which really worried my, my the editor. I, I, there were those three cartoons that, and I was, I was saying, okay, you seeing me for these? I'm sticking right back in your face as well. Mm -hmm. So defiance and being careful and paper trails and winning ultimately, in my case, I suppose because he was forced to drop mm -hmm. them. But in your case, hopefully if they do go through with it, you've got all your ducks in a row, you've got mm -hmm. good lawyers. They're going to advise you better than I am on all the niceties of, of everything, but uh, it feels to me like you're doing the right mm -hmm. thing. You used to being a public figure. I feel very uncomfortable that this, that what the effect, I don't know if it was the intended effect, 
But the effect of this laptop is to make me more of the story than I should be. The social workers not shouldn't become the story. But I, I had to stick my head mm. above the parapet because my clients have been shot and killed. Yeah, absolutely. So I, absolutely. Uh, I live in Joburg. Yeah. I can actually speak yeah. out. You know, you're, you're fighting for everything that you believe is right and, and, and I fully believe that, that is right um, and if you become part of that story I mean it's 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 always been the case whenever you need but going back to that stuff we were talking about right at the beginning when you did have a few decent uh, nights in those old days or one or two of them <laughs> you could have somebody fighting on behalf of other people being a, mm -hmm. a champion of a cause and, um, I mean, if you become part of that story, well, so be it. Mm. I mean, there are people who have less resources, less power, less uh, privilege, and, and are, are, are unable to do as much. I, I mean, I think as a group of people, you have other things at your disposal, and fantastic if you can well, do, I mean, it, do I, it. I've simply done my job as a social exactly, worker. I've yeah. never stepped out of my boundaries. That, my lane is clearly demarcated yeah. by my professional code of practice. Yeah. Journalists, there's a much more fluid boundaries aren't there now you've got to make judgment calls because about the lines haven't been drawn yeah. yet you'll only push the envelope until somebody tries to push yeah. it back my feeling when i start out doing my drawings and really when i was doing six drawings a week or five drawings a week occasionally even seven i would start out with listening to the radio and all that and i would write down the subjects i'm interested in and then speaking to people and and my attitudes next to them and then start linking them and then thinking, actually, that's surprising, but that sort of links with that one. So I do these little mind maps, all completely conceptual, no drawings, no anything. Okay. That's how I start. I'm starting. I'm not looking for the next joke. I'm not looking for the next belly laugh. I'm looking for something to say. Mm. Mm. Then I'm looking for a way to say it. Mm. And then humor becomes the best tool, but not the only one. You could, it could be outrage. It could mm. be pathos. It could be mm. bathos where you'd use the anticlimax, yes. uh, any of that, but the, all of those are just vehicles. It could be discursive. I really think I need a discussion. Do it in comic strip mm. form and have a twist. Everything has to have a twist. You have to have a twist in a single panel. Mm. It's all, humor and satire is all about surprise and twist. Mm. Whether it's shocking or just sad or just mm. cerebral or hilariously funny, it's all about surprise. So that, that, that second bit is trying to find how you're going to twist it and also sometimes trying to find the metaphors that make it work well. Mm. That can be from biblical stuff, story, uh, classical mm. things can be increasingly from pop culture. Pop culture is probably the best for us now because it's easiest to understand for the majority of people. So it would be an advert or a movie or a TV show or, a, or something or a meme. And uh, that's, that becomes the, the, the vehicle that you use to, to tell the story. And who is a match of interest? Because I've just watched a series on Monty Python and mm. the great things. I mean, Life of Brian, all these sorts of things. I mean, Life of Brian and uh, the, the, the Holy Grail, the Monty Python, those two movies in particular are, I mean, they're, they're seminal and they're brilliant and they have absolutely fantastic satire. In the, they, were, they were big inspirations. Earlier than that, the, the sheer wackiness of it, the, the goon show, yeah, mostly audio for me. We weren't really seeing many of the images back then in the 60s and 70s, we, it, although we saw the movie uh, and now for something completely different. But we weren't seeing the series, right. so it was mostly what we heard from them. Yeah. Cartoon-wise, Giles, I saw those from when I was three or four years old. Uh, mm. They were lying around at our house. Charles was quite a progressive, actually. Mm. Um, not a, he wasn't, you know, hardcore lefty, but he was a, quite a progressive, mm. stuck up for every mm. person. But you know that sort of thing. Uh, his newspaper group was far more reactionary. It was owned by Lord Beaverbrook, who was not exactly a progressive. Mm. <laughs> he was the opposite. And then uh, Tintin. Mm. And again, I only later discovered the politics in Tintin and the fact mm. that he some of his earliest stuff was virulently anti-left mm. and very and quite patronizing and racist mm. but he he grew and he moved mm. uh, peanuts and um, and then magazine, I, absolutely you know, we're renovating our house we yeah. found a 1987 mad magazine and it's actually to read it you know, history at that time through that lens of humor look what mad magazine did was it taught some americans and it taught a lot of uh, people elsewhere in the world as well 
to read between the lines, not to accept things at face value. Really fantastic, because they were the first re people to really take apart things like adverts and all that stuff that was coming out of 50s and 60s America. Uh, the big advert, big adverts, and the big and the and the TV series, and they, I mean they had Harvey Kurtzman, who's the, I was the one lucky enough to be taught by, in 1988 uh, in and and 89 in in New York. He was not that well anymore, but he was teaching satirical mm -hmm. cartooning at the School of Visual Arts, yeah, and he was also a big influence on somebody else who was an influence on me, Art Spiegelman. Mm -hmm. uh, he attributes a lot of his stuff to, mm -hmm. to Harvey Kurtzman. Uh, Art Spiegelman, of course, did Mouse, and I was lucky enough to do an independent study with Spiegelman in 1990. So I was coming across these greats. Uh, I was also taught by Will Eisner at the School of mm. Visual Arts. But the thing about Mad Magazine, the, all those, uh, you know, uh, Al Jaffe and Kurtzman and Mort Drucker and mm. Sergio Aragones and, um, and, and um, Don Martin. Uh, Don Martin. So yes. now Don Martin was known for all those like whatever noises, those very like crazy, uh, like outrageous noises, like farting noises and whatever. The people that we really would love to know how they, uh, you know, react to your cartoons are the subjects, particularly the politicians. What is your relationship with our contemporary politicians? And do they appreciate and do they get the message? Because that's, it seems to me that part of the problem of power is that it kind of, detaches you from mm. reality and that's what the whole notion of cartooning was to bring people back. You know, some of them get it, some of them don't get it. Some of them are beyond the pale. And it, coming back to a question that, you, like right at the very beginning, you were talking about speaking truth to power and speaking truth about power. Mm. There are times when I'm trying to speak to those people, truth to them and see what happens. But there are other times when I know that they are completely beyond the pale. Mm. I actually don't even care what they think because I know I can't affect them. Mm. They are too far gone. But you can speak to people about them and try and show them in a, in a, in a different light. Try and throw some light mm. on things that people haven't quite got. Mm. Or just show my subjective version of what they're doing and see if that helps to illuminate things a bit. Mm. There are people who I can speak to some of whom were in the trenches with me and I'm sure with you mm -hmm. back in the old days like fighting in mm -hmm. uh, doing things in the UDF uh, people I got to know and if they can step out of line or, or it's again a subjective decision mm -hmm. on my part but I can shame them a bit with the, with the drawings mm -hmm. you get people who really are you know have done a deal with the devil I don't think the cartoons are going to make one iota of mm -hmm. difference but within society, it is quite amazing to me that South Africa has been recognized by the Cartoonist Rights Network International. They said they have not come across another democracy where cartoons have had a bigger effect mm. on, on the society than they found in South Africa. So that means that we are making some uh, Before you close, can I just ask two questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because you mentioned that um, your inspiration, what gets you. So I would like to find out um, what is your total uninspiration to you? Something that um, just want you to never want to draw again. And The closest thing that came to shutting me down that's happened is the issue around the cartoon I was talking about before, the, the organ grinder's monkey cartoon. It was such a misstep in the sense that I misread the mood. P Penny Sparrow, mm. a real racist, who had really compared black people to monkeys, that thing had happened in, the, in that year. And for me to even try and do a nuanced thing, which certainly didn't do the same thing, and certainly with, even with my track record of okay, three and a half decades of anti-racist, uh, activism. What happened around that and the way that my forces were marshaled against me, that I can't think of anything worse than that. It, for me, it was worse than the death threats I've got. It was worse than being in detention without trial. Uh, it was worse than, it was worse than anything. It mm. felt like I was being delegitimized and, and everything that I had tried to do was being made null and void. That, that feeling meant that I, that I really felt like that could destroy so that was me. your dark cave 
And oh, well, I, I don't know if I had to do it. Uh, I certainly regret where it, it took me and what happened. And there were certain people who had it in for me. And I see it happening to other people as well. And I think that that the where your intellectual insides are taken out and sort of mm. shredded around a bit, um, and and you you can actually lose. I nearly lost my nerve. I nearly gave up. Mm. And I can't think of anything else that's ever made me now, feel like that. Now, has it that. made you a better cartoonist as you've emerged from that cave? Have you got an elixir, as Joseph Campbell's thing, as you're getting back to the familiar place? I don't want to give enough credit to the people who were trying to destroy me to say it's made me a better cartoonist and all that. What I do want to say is, I, you know, I used to ask a couple of questions. I used to ask the question with, of myself and of editors. Does it work? And can we justify it? And that's what I asked for over a couple of decades. In the last few years, last decade, I've been asking a third question. And that third question, which I should have asked then, and which I do ask myself now, is if we do it, could the damage caused by certain interpretations that I'm not really wanting to happen, misinterpretations, misinterpretations or perversions of it or whatever, if I do it in a certain way, could that be so damaging as to nullify whatever good effects I'm trying to do with the, the politics of it and all that. And okay. if so, find another way to say it. Okay. And that I, I said to Andy in an interview, for me it's the difference between self-censorship and emotional intelligence. Lovely. And uh, because I'm self-censoring would, would be if you're actually not prepared to go that far. And, in, and emotional intelligence is, I'm going to go that far, I'm going to say it, Lovely. but I'll have to find a different way to say it. Good. How do you feel about the, the, the way things are right now in South Africa, the state of our country? We, we supposedly emerged from state capture. Some of us don't think we have. There's still the traditional courts bill. You've done some stuff about that, which is a great encouragement to us. You know, you've been around for a long time, 35 or so years. How do you see things panning out next year? So, seeing as you've, you've asked this as a sort of like a final question that I could answer quite quickly, it sort of feels to me like there's a great Peanuts cartoon from many, many years ago, which I, I love Peanuts, I think is philosophy, mm -hmm. where one of the kids uh, says, explain the First World War. Use both sides of the paper if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a huge question. Mm. I, okay, I'll try and be short about it. I'll say that, I mean, we are really still on the edge of that blooming abyss. Mm. And it's not only Jacob Zuma and his cronies that have put us there. It started before that. Mm. It started in Becky's time. It even started in the Debus time. And some of the missteps that happened economically, uh, and which Madiba was even part of, but, uh, you know, I think when the, when the reconstruction and development program was canned, I think at the time that was, I believe that was, uh, there was a time when we could have actually pulled ourselves somewhere beyond where we went. Uh, and now there isn't that opportunity because the, 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 the world economy is, is tough. Things are really difficult. We've been taken down this terrifying wormhole of corruption by Zuma, Guptas, Basasa, cronies, whatever, uh, and, and others, and the fellow travelers in the form of, uh, you know, blue chip companies from overseas, uh, you know, the, 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 there's always been this sort of mutualism, this symbiosis in, in corruption, and, uh, and it's incredibly difficult to come out of that. I, I, even with that question that I'm asking on the front of the book, which side is up, I mean, the bad side of the ANC is irrevocably bad. I, I would even still like to see a split. Mm -hmm. The good side is not all good, uh, but it's, it's a thousand times better than the, than the bad mm -hmm. side. We have to rely on, the, on that, that, some of that good side. We have to rely on the fact that we do have strong media. We uh, have made some missteps, but we have amazing stuff coming out of I mean, I'm lucky enough to be a daily maverick, some of the best and I'm a Bungani. And then you have civil society and, and people like yourselves and, and, and NGOs. Uh, you have some good people left in political parties. It, you, you also have to hope and believe because if you don't believe, then there's nothing. There's nothing left. I mean, you actually have to believe that some of these things can help uh, so that pockets of people working together can actually 
mm-hmm. try and push things in different directions. That's the, that's the best. I mean, it's not a great answer, but it's the best I can offer. Well, you haven't lost your sense of humor. And as long as, <laughs> as, long as we don't lose our sense of humor, um, I guess there's hope. Um, and he will never retire anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different question. Me, myself, and my, where I'm going, I, I, I do want to move into doing some of my stories, mm. personal stories, mm. some political stories, but in comic mm. form, in long form. I'm not saying I'll do exactly what I'm doing forever, mm. but I, I certainly have a lot more in me to, to draw and to write about. Well, I certainly look forward to that, and you mentioned, you know, it's peanuts. Uh, a fitting cartoon somebody sent me on social media. And one character says, oh, you only live once. And I think Charlie Ross says, no, you only die once. <laughs> you live every day. It's been a huge privilege to be associated with you and have got to know you as a friend, and as a mentor and as a trailblazer. Thanks so much, John. Good luck. <laughs> Great.